this week we're going to be talking about kinship and marriage and also related to that gender and sexuality and of course gender and sexuality are something that uh, many different people have studied and incorporated into their uh, studies but the idea of kinship is in some ways i don't know if it's unique to anthropology but it's pretty uh, it's pretty unique i guess i would say there isn't a there isn't a separate discipline that studies kinship in the way that anthropologists have the early anthropologists starting you know at about 100 150 years ago were super interested in kinship how people were related to the each other and how people thought about those relationships and they assumed that there were these universal human experiences. Obviously, in order to have a human society, in order to keep going as a human society, we have to mate, reproduce, and give birth, and nurture those children. And they have to grow up and do the same thing. They have to, what we call, reproduce. And so the early idea was, they assumed that from this universal experience, the fact that all people biologically had to do this, that then people would have pretty similar ideas about relationships, who was related to whom, who should marry whom, who was a father, who was a mother, etc. They also believed that you could if the society didn't conform to what they considered to be the biological pattern, that maybe they were backwards or primitive, or they didn't know what biology, what reproduction was, they didn't know the genetics involved, they didn't understand. And so there was an idea that you could sort of group different societies and put them on a, on a ladder from you know, the people who were smartest about this to the people who didn't seem to know what was going on. So this was the original, or one of the, some of the original ideas to the extent that uh, in the olden days, say in the 1950s, if I were teaching this class, we would have talked about all kinds of kinship terms and kinship patterns and patrilineages and matrilineages and people who reckon descent through uh, their fathers, brothers, and mothers, sisters. I'm just making things up now because there's all kinds of different ways that people do this. What we found is that actually there isn't just one way to do kinship. There's all kinds of different ways in which people reckon who is related to whom, who should be related to whom, who should inherit things from one person to another, and that these things are socially made. Of course, people have to reproduce, but whether or not you feel more kinship with your father, mother, or somebody else is actually a social issue. And so one of the things we can immediately discard is this idea that somehow some societies have it right or more sophisticated ideas and some societies have it wrong. In fact, other societies, many other societies looking at our own would say that we are remarkably dumb when it comes to our kinship terms. We use the same term uncle to indicate somebody on the father's side and somebody on the mother's side. When in other societies, those would be radically different relationships and to call both people uncle would be insanity. So a lot of people have, a lot of different societies have many more different kinds of kinship terms that specifically delineate these relationships. Uh, in some ways, we're a, bit, we're a bit backwards when it comes to kinship and our ideas of kinship. But again, you can't rank societies. There's all different kinds of ways to do this. Uh, to do this thing. I wanted to pull out a rather classic article from a biological anthropologist named Sarah Blaffer Hurdy. This article comes to us from, uh, it was first published in Natural History in 2001, so it's about 20 years ago, but it's held up remarkably well. 
I've gone back to it again and again, and it seems to say something fairly profound. I pulled it out again for this class about how we do kinship and how we how we raise our children and also ties us back into some of the stuff that we were thinking about in biological anthropology and evolution. So Julie, if you had to say one, what is this article about? What is the big point here? Cooperative breeders, let's start there. That humans, like some close primate relatives, but not all, are cooperative breeders. That we need help in order to breed our offspring. Our offspring are particularly, uh, as we learned in, in Meredith Small's article in Our Babies Ourselves, our offspring are particularly helpless they aren't able to move around, they aren't able to get by themselves, and they need a lot of calories in order to get going and do their thing. And so humans can't just offload their offspring into the wild, so to speak, and it's hard for a single person to take care of a human infant. So we do this thing where we need more people to do it. What does this help us do, Leo? Why would we be cooperative breeders if it's so hard, if it's so hard to have so many calories? Is there any evolutionary advantage to this? It helps us do something, it helps us, what's the, what does it help us do? What can we do if, we're, if we use this cooperative breeding and spread out the advantage, the ev evolutionary advantage is, we're able to get more flexibility and spread out into more habitats. And according to Herdy, that's one of the big reasons that humans are able to, uh, to migrate, as we talked about in the last class, to be mobile and to cover more territory and to eventually spread out into all of the habitable world, even though we have these, uh, these particularly helpless infants. So what Herdy wants us to talk about here is what she calls, and what other biologists call, allo mothers. So we know about biological mothers. These would be the, the other people who are helping out. Of course, obviously, you could think about the father, and that's important. But you can also have siblings and aunts and uncles and other people. You need you need a whole bunch of people often to do this kind of thing. And there's different ways that human beings have, uh, how to say, recruited other people to be helpful to them as they're raising offspring. Anaya, what's one of the ways in which people recruit more people to help out with their kids? All right, yeah, this may seem a little bit strange to us because we, of course, believe that, you know, there's only one father and there's only, that's, that's all you have because, you know, what were we taught? The egg and the sperm unite and that's how you, how uh, that's, that's what determines the fatherhood or of the parent, but in, other societies, there's this idea that the child has to be built up over time. The developing fetus has to be built up. It's kind of like being fed. And so you could actually, you need to do this. You might need to have multiple sperm washings. And that means you can have two or more biological fathers. Now, this might not be this might not hold up in Johnstown, but as a belief, yeah, I see else, and you're like, ah, that's not right. Exactly. It's not scientifically right, but it might culturally help if you're trying to get some extra help in uh, for raising the child. So interestingly, a lot of 
So they've done some calculations on this in some of the areas where they have these beliefs that, you know, you can, some of the people who, who are able to recruit more than one father then have better survival and health outcomes than if you are not. So it contributes to total care. There's something else that's interesting that, that, that seems to happen to fathers or males as well who are close to infants. What else happens, Jake? What we're all afraid of. <laughs> yeah, fatherhood seems to produce hormonal changes depending on the proximity to the infant. Now, some people have said that this might be just sleep deprivation and you don't you actually don't want to have too much testosterone around so don't be too afraid about this but it seems like this this is an observation that has gotten some support over the last 20 years since this article was written there do seem to be these kinds of hormonal changes obviously especially for the mother but also for a proximate male and i guess i should say here that as uh as hurdy points out the hormonal response that's coming in from the male is actually not necessarily because of genetic relatedness. It has to do with physical proximity and total care. And so what Hurdy is arguing for is that actually, and especially among cooperative breeders, just because you are genetically related does not mean you're going to form these parenting bonds. You need to have that interaction between infant and caregivers. We've seen a little of this before with the, uh, the baboons and uh, how the friend was more, at, more likely to provide uh, paternal type care than the actual biological father. So genetics doesn't, you're not gonna automatically be attracted to even your genetically biological infant. And people always need to be careful of this. We've now realized this is a hugely important thing. The uh, postpartum depression and those kinds of things can be a very serious issue because it's not, it's not an automatic process, especially among, as Hurdy put it, cooperative breeders. In fact, if mothers don't feel supported, what's likely to happen among cooperative breeders if a mother doesn't feel that she's being supported and that this is not, not gonna be a very good outcome? Yeah. Well, that would be good. Yeah, you have to have to try something. What's the other thing that's, that's also likely to happen? What if he can't? Infant abandonment is very high among cooperative breeders. If mothers are unable to find support, they tend to, tend to abandon a child. So this is not just true among our own species, it's among, true among other uh, species as well. So what, Hurdy ends up arguing for here is that in our contemporary world, when we're obviously in a society where women are working and <clears throat> men are working too, and all sorts of people need childcare, that we don't, the idea that every child has to only be with its mother is not what you most need. What you most need is the total care opportunity, the security that you get from having a, a larger support network. And so what she argues for is that instead of having this debate about whether kids should stay at home or whether they should be with their mothers or what who should be, we need to work on making daycare better and more accessible and providing uh, people who will help out uh, all along the the life process there. I found it interesting, like I said, I hadn't, I hadn't actually uh, 
it's been a while since I assigned this classic article. And when I turned into the end of it, I was surprised this was from 2001. So 20 plus years ago, where she writes, even if we manage to survive what most people are worrying about, global warming, emergent diseases, rogue viruses, <gasps> whoa, those are the things that I'm worried about too. How did she know? No, she knew this 21 years ago. Meteorites crashing into earth. Well, that one I'm not currently worried about, but I might start being worried about. So she says here, even if we manage to survive what most people are worrying about, will we still be human thousands of years down the line? What she's saying is, have, are we starting to raise our infants in a way that is moving them away from this basic human characteristic of being able to look someone in the eyes and establish those bonds of compassion and empathy? And so what she's arguing for is we need to, in some ways, be attentive to our, our history and our biology as cooperative breeders and thus pay attention to these kinds of bonds. But like I said, wow, I was like impressed. She predicted the future right there 20 years ago. I think it's probably pretty important to have some compassion and empathy now as well to survive the rogue viruses. Big point here. There's all different ways that we think of ourselves as related to others and the people who have helped us to survive and to thrive. And so we need, kinship is something that isn't just a one-off. It's not just a con contribution of blood, genes, sperm, or eggs. Even people who are related by what we call blood, genes, those kinds of things, it needs to be constantly addressed, reinforced, care, food, clothing, those kinds of things are hugely important in how, uh, how we make our kinship relationships and how we see others. And so this idea that this is simply a, a biological given is not how humans actually do this. We do this socially and culturally, and we need to do it even if we claim biological relatedness.